I'm so glad to be here. Introducing the panel, cultural appreciation is not cultural, no, cultural appropriation is not cultural appropriation. ATA, I put a very complicated name in the name. Yeah, <laughs> they put the Latinos to pronounce such words. Whose idea was that? Cultural appropriation is not cultural appreciation. That's reversed. Well, the other way around. Cultural appreciation. For all of you dyslexics out there, that it makes works sense. Either way. You get the idea. And to my left, I have Ada Sarate, who just happens to be a writer, a comic book artist, an illustrator, and one of the most important figures in the Mexican comic book media. So we'll give a big round of applause to Ada for you. The Mexican media is not that big, it's very close. Five, maybe. Yeah. But thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming here, which has been two very long years. And you made it. Congratulations, we need to applaud them. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And next to her we have Mitch Hyman, who is not only one of the nicest guys I know, but he's also a filmmaker, a screenwriter, and now a book writer. Have a big round of applause for Mitch, please. Thank you, everybody. Uh, what I'm best known for is a comic book character in a film known as Bubba the Redneck Werewolf. Yes. You can get it free on Tubi now, but we were number one on Hulu for a while. Um, until they found out we kind of hijacked their satellite and a few other things went on. But that's okay. My wife's in cybersecurity and it's all covered, right, honey? Yes, dear. See? All the scenes are gone. So before we begin, we must uh, define this very complex term. So cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. Yes. Could one of you please give us a meaning of one of them? Well, <laughs> I think that we have heard a lot about cultural appropriation lately. When someone, usually white, decides to get inspiration from another culture, but that inspiration is just surface. Like, well, one of the most common examples is with uh, Oaxaca's uh, seam dresses. They make some wonderful needlework. And then there comes Versace, Gucci, Sara, and they make it for everyone, but claiming that it's their original design and not giving any money to the Oaxaca natives who are the ones who made them in the first place. So that is cultural appropriation, literally. Grabbing something that is not yours and claiming that you created it or you discovered it or you revol revol ah! You see, I am very, very bad at this sometimes. <laughs> That you created a revolution with it because you had it. And profit with it. Oh yeah, profit. But that's that, that's the most important thing. Like for example, I am I know that I am going to talk bad about probably one restaurant that you all know, Taco Bell. <laughs> Those are not tacos. <laughs> Please people understand tacos are not supposed to be steam. <laughs> Flautas are flautas. <laughs> All right, hang on, let me jump in here though, but it's three o'clock in the morning. Come on, everybody. Yeah, and drunk. Tacos are tacos, which means Steve tacos. But that's what you're Yeah. Those are not, but those are not the ones in Taco Bell. Yeah, 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 it's like, it's <laughs> Taco shells are not tacos. I'm going to step off for a while. Look back in the No, <laughs> let's not teach talks about cultural appreciation. Okay, now appreciation, this is a different story altogether. And it sounds, this is going to sound a little bizarre, but the pizza bagel. Seriously, the pizza bagel. Because the bagel started out as, honestly, it was a religious bread that was given to pregnant women back in the 1600s in Poland to ensure that they would have a healthy child and the circle of life would continue. Then many years go by, and some gentleman decides that, you know, I put some sauce on this, I take this from the Italians, I take the cheese, 
order to make cheese. Next thing I know, I got something that you don't have to go to Taco Bell at three o'clock in the morning and get because you can just stick it in the microwave and you're good to go. That stops your whole argument right there. The point is about the appreciation end of it is that when we see something we really like, and then we know it's coming from another culture, but we actually say something about the fact that it came from here. The appreciation part is when we show appreciation, we show gratitude for what they've come up with and for what we're accepting. And the whole point is, it's not anything about cancel culture, because cancel culture is ridiculous, if you really think about it. Because nothing's ever really canceled. I mean, how many of you still have things on the internet that you're still trying to go, I can't get out of this subscription? <laughs> The point is simply this, though. The appreciation end of it becomes when we sit there and say thank you to these people, or if we're interested in something, we go to them and we talk to them and we ask about it. Because then nothing gets canceled, because honestly, how can you cancel if you were cool about asking about it? You can always say, I talked to this person and this person. Now, I and I just worked on a book. It's called Chevella Cthulhu, I mean, Ch Chevella Chocolate and Cthulhu. Oh, but we'll, we'll get there. We will. No, no. But you I'm, are going but, ahead. No, yeah. All I'm saying, though, is that the fact that when I did the research for the book, I got a hold of Seth, I got a hold of Ada and a few other Mexican friends, and learned and researched so I could sit there and sit down and tell this story. So I'm trying to say that I asked permission before I went ahead and did it. And that's as simple as it comes down to just ask permission. That's it. Yeah, and I agree with you with, uh, with the whole thing you said about culture cancel, uh, cancellation culture because, well, I'm a comedian, so that's like my everyday fear. But, okay, I... He's one of the funny ones. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I try to. Yeah, but you, you never know when a, when a joke can go on like what you don't mean to. But that's just what comedians fear every day. So, I had mentioned that uh, cultural uh, appropriation has been very popular recently because cases like uh, what happened to my dear people of Oaxaca. But actually, cultural appropriation has is, is as old as human culture itself, isn't it? Mitch? Well, can, can you talk about a uh, bit of the history of the cultural appropriation? Well, you know, it's really funny. We can go way, way, way back into history if you want, and you can sit there and talk about the Romans and the Greeks. And the fact that we started out originally with the Greeks and they had Zeus and the pantheon of gods. And then the Romans, after their culture started, the Greek culture started to fall, the Romans picked up on it, and then Zeus became Jupiter. It was the same god, it was just called a different name. But still had the same powers and abilities. And so there's a lot of things. Children. <laughs> and a lot of these things turn out to be that it can be something that was established, but then it's kind of been readapted by another society that, after the other society was gone, moved it further forward. Again, showing a sense of appreciation. And well, for example, I think that we have the best example of cultural appropriation in Mexico with the Congress, the Spaniards. They came and they decided to build their city on top of our city, which was built on top of a lake. It is not very structurally sound. <laughs> that is why we have problems with that. That's a volcano. <laughs> the volcano was, okay, yes, the volcano was before the lake. <laughs> See, I did my research, she did. She, was, she lives there. Well, then we have an example, he actually learned. But for example, Mexican culture is a very open culture. We like when people come and learn from us. An example is, which I know some people See it as a very controversial is Day of the Dead. I have seen that some people think that wearing the school, the, the sugar school makeup, the Katrina makeup, could be cultural appropriation. It isn't. I can tell you, we Mexicans love seeing people share that particular part of our culture. Even if the even at the first you only think Oh, that looks cool. And that's all you know about that part of our culture. We love to share it. And then we have the very, very traditional uh, parade of the Day of the Dead. Yeah. It's a very ancient tradition that goes all the way back to 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I am not joking. For the movie Spectrum, they decided that they wanted to have him the Day of the Dead parade except that didn't exist. 
<laughs> Mexicans, we don't do parades that much. We're Cinco de Mayo guys, I hate to tell you, we're only in Puebla, that's it. Um, but now we do, now we're, oh, oh, the Americans think we do it. Oh, we must do it. It's <laughs> used to get drunk, then go to Taco Bell, get those tacos I talked about, you get to stay home, do the same thing, and get the pizza table. I'm just saying. Well, the, the truth is with Mexican, Mexican culture is fast. We like to have a lot. So when they went with the parade in the movies, I said, well, you know what? This looks like fun. Uh, they said, oh, this looks like another place we can get drunk in public. <laughs> but who doesn't like a good time? It's the same thing that goes on in New Orleans during Mardi Gras because if there's some religious aspects to it, Creole Cajun, two different things, by the way. Everybody seems to get that always confused, okay? Cajun's more from Canadian uh, French that moved down into Louisiana, and Creole is more the African Americans who settled into the Caribbean. I lived in I lived in the West Indies for a while, and you get a very, very, very strong sense of how they feel about it. It's the spice palette that they trade back and forth. And the wonderful thing is, though, with a lot of things that we do, it's through food and music and art that we learn to appreciate a lot of other cultures. It's also how the appropriation begins, because if you think it's innocent enough, there's no problem. Now, it's not just held to just the white people or the Caucasians, whatever. There was an incident recently where BTS, the K-pop band, decided to finally give a million dollars back to Black Lives Matter, because a lot of the rappers and a lot of the African-American songwriters had been writing music for them, but they weren't getting either royalties or they weren't getting recognition. And again, let's look at, let's look at anime and manga. And the wonderful thing about that though is that every culture has done their own version of it, including Ada has done, you know, Mexican manga, manga. But it was just adding to this wonderful mix. So let's go back to Creole and Cajun and spice blends and gumbo and all that because this is this beautiful blend that's starting to come up. And then everybody can enjoy it because we have the same thing. The same character is just like, and the same emotions, the same everything else. It works. So in a lot of ways, that can be appreciation, not so much appropriation. Again, it comes to the asking. When one person draws, for example, anime. I love anime. Uh, it's my jam. My favorite anime is based on a French book. So it was a Mexican girl who got inspired by a Japanese animation, which is an art that started in the United States because it was based on a French book, <laughs> which in turn was inspired by an English previous book. I am talking about uh, Remy, Sans Famille, uh, Nobody's Boy. Anyone who is from Mexico or speaks Spanish knows what anime I'm talking about. Remy was a trauma for my generation. Uh, but it is very influenced by Oliver Twist. And if we go back, we were going to start looking at all the other roots. So what we're trying to say here is, it's okay to learn from other cultures. It's okay to try to immerse yourself in other cultures, as long as it's with the other people involved. Not, oh, I watched an anime and now I know how Japan is, <laughs> because I don't. Yeah, and I think it's the way you do it, and, and, if you, and if it's a contribution to your work or your art, or you're just taking it for it because it works. It happens a lot in movies where directors just remake the same scene from another movie, and they say it's a love letter or a match. But it's not because they never asked the first director to make, they, they took a scene that worked, a couple of shots and cuts that work, and put it together in another movie, and that's not actually not better, that's not saying I respect your work, because if you did, you would, you would have asked the director or the filmmaker, hey, I love what you do and I'm gonna make evident that I am respecting your work, but not try to hide it as my own work. So I'll actually give you one of my favorite examples. Uh, there was a movie that was done by a gentleman named Sergio Leone, who used to basically Italian westerns and film in Spain. And one of them was called The Magnificent Seven. Now, 
a lot of you who don't understand film history understand that originally it was a film from Japan called The Seven Samurai. Okay? It took a long time before people realized that this was basically appropriated until the film director himself came forward and had something to say about it. And that's when people started realizing, well, wait a minute, where is all this coming from? And the first question started getting raised because you go to the theater or you'll read a book or you hear some music and you go, that's really, really cool. And you just accept it, enjoy it, and go on with it. But there's more to the background of it. And the coolest part is, if you decide to look into the background of it, you just hear a little, like something, somebody says, well, that's not really from here and here. You are starting to learn. You're starting to understand. You're starting to understand the root of it all. And then you'll find other things that are hidden back there that are even cooler that never brought, got brought forward. So what you do, if you can, you try to get a hold of who's in charge of source material and see if you can get permission to bring it forward. And then you have done something great in the world because you've given recognition to people that didn't get any at all and a chance for everybody else to enjoy something they had no idea has such a wonderfully rich background. And you're doing yourself a favor. I'm going to give another example close to Mexican culture. Coco. I, I'm pretty sure that everybody here has seen Coco. Coco is amazing and it's a movie that, is, that feels so Mexican that it's one of the very few movies that has been celebrated in the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. But a lot of people will say, well, it's Disney. Disney is not Mexican. The director is not Mexican. The writer is not Mexican. And that is true. But what they did was that they came to Mexico and they lived with the families in Puebla, in Oaxaca, in Sinaloa, and learned about their costume, about their culture, about how we are. And they made a, a movie that is as wonderful in Mexican as El Libro de la Vida, Book of Life, which is a Mexican movie made by a Mexican director, Jorge Gutierrez, right. as opposed to a movie that was made about the same time as Coco. Uh, the name in English is Salma's Big Wish. In Spanish, it's called Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead, which despite being a Mexican production with a whole team of Mexican animators and Mexican writers, doesn't feel Mexican. And it's not just because every single character is white and green-eyed, because there are Mexicans who are white and green-eyed. I swear I am Mexican. <laughs> uh, but because the story felt more like a, an European fairy tale about a girl who was looking for her parents and ended up traveling to the land of the dead, which is not even called Mictlán. So that's where you see, sometimes there is also the fact that the original people, and I, Sebastian is not going to let me lie, we become a little bit ashamed of our own culture because we are not used to see it in the stories. We don't see ourselves in movies. We don't see ourselves on TV. We don't read about ourselves in books because we get everything translated. Because Cinderella is a thousand times more popular than any fairy tale in Latin America, even if it's not really European because the original Cinderella was Chinese. And let's talk about cultural appropriation with the Greeks. And we like to buy and consume the stuff that comes from other countries. And now here comes a polemic, and I want Europeans. Um, you were talking about Coco. A few years ago, when the movie came out, there was this papel picado, which is a decoration we use for the Day of the Dead that was made with the figures of Coco, the movie. And just because this was a Disney product, an American product, a papel picado usually costs, uh, what is it, less than a dollar. These ones were about four dollars, five dollars, and- Oh yes, 100 pesos. Yeah, and people began to buy these ones instead of the ones made by Mexicans. With Which costed five pesos. That becomes a problem. Yeah, half, That's when it's a problem. Yeah, half a dollar. And, and they had more traditional prints and more traditional images, the people began to buy the ones that had Miguel and Dante in it and Echo and More the important thing, for example, alebrijes. Alebrijes are very important for Mexican culture, especially because you don't make two of the same. 
Every single allegory hair is a little bit different, either in painting or in figure. An allegory hair is like, well, like Dante in Coco would be an allegory hair when he turns into a guy for his death. They are Mexican Pokemon. They are Mexican Pokemon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes, they are Mexican Pokemon, but we did it first. <laughs> so we have to go and talk to Nintendo yeah. about that. And you don't catch any of them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard to do Yeah, and you cannot catch them all because they are women. But the thing is, again, people were buying the 200 peso, the 300 peso Dante plushie. When you could go to the Citadella, which is an artisanal market, and buy a real alegrije, a real wooden alegrije, for just a hundred pesos. Or worse, they were going, oh, but a hundred pesos for an alegrije is too much. Until you put the Disney tag, and then it was cheap. You see, but there's a lot of that, and go to other examples. Everybody seems to forget that the US has a protectorate named Samoa. Now, what's really big these days is tiki culture, right? What a lot of people don't realize, and I had a friend who was Samoan, when we're putting these gods up in our houses or we're making tiki drinks to them, we're getting, you know, all the things we do with them and all the way we kind of tiki mugs and the way we did put Star Wars as a tiki mug, this is a tiki mug, that's all a tiki mug. These are gods. And they do have, let's say, tempers. A uh, great example is one time, a long time, I went to a friend of mine's house and he was very proud of this volcanic rock he had. And I looked at him and I sat there and said, where did you get that? He told me he got it in Hawaii. And he told me where he got it. And we all know about Pele, don't we? If you don't know about Pele, you've seen Moana. So I think you get an idea. So Maui can show up in any minute. And it's going to be not Dwayne the Rock, I promise you that much. Rats. He was having the worst run of luck I've ever seen in my life since he came back with that. I told him, give it to me. I fought, got it from him. I put it into a box and then nailed it back to the national park. Things stopped after that. <laughs> now you can be superstitious, not superstitious, but remember a lot of people go to church or they go to temples, no matter what kind they are. I used to volunteer at a Buddhist temple. They learned a lot of a culture there, spending three years there working with them. The thing you realize this is that if you have a faith and a belief in this, then it can manifest in ways you don't expect. Because or, you're inviting a bit of negativity, and that negativity can build on other negativity. Or in so short, it's something to think about. Or in short, do not take rocks from other people without asking for permission. Very much. <laughs> it's the same, do not take from the culture. But at the same time, let's be kind to each other. We are talking about corporation most of the time. Disney, Fox, Sarah, Taco Bell, Sorry, I am not going to let that go. You need proper tacos in this country. And Taco Bell and Chipotle are not eat. I'm going to give up trying to do anything educational here. I'm just going to just turn it loose to Taco Bell and I'm done. Sorry. That's it. Uh, no, but I'm... Um, yeah, but the thing is being honest with what you take from other yeah, people. I want to just appreciate it. But for example, um, so we just had Halloween. And there is always always someone who does a Halloween costume that is not correct. But we go back <coughs> to the asking and the open cultures versus closed cultures. We Mexicans, most of us, we don't care if you dress up as a mariachi. Well, actually, we won't care if you dress up as a child. We will get a little bit angry if you dress as a mariachi. And there is a difference. And that's what we should try to learn. What is the difference between a chavo and a mariachi? And then avoid the second one, unless you are an actual mariachi. If you can play in a mariachi band, you can dress up as a mariachi. You have my permission. <laughs> if any of this is confusing, there will be a transcript available in the lobby. <laughs> With pictures, okay? It's all about pictures. Ah, uh, yeah. You want to dress up as a Katrina? Go ahead. You want to paint your face as a sugar school? Go ahead. Even better if you actually go to a Mexican person and pay them to do the makeup for you. That's because really that's, good. you know, that's more authentic. Yeah, it's paying respect to, to its mm -hmm. origin. But do not dress as a Native American unless you are a Native American. Because Native American tribes have a closet culture. 
And in order to dress like them, you have to ask for their permission. And it's a completely different thing. If a family from Japan gives you a kimono, well, then that family, that particular family, gave you permission of that particular kimono. If the thing is sold in the museum of the country that, that you go, for example, in Mexico, we sell a lot of clothes at museums. Seriously, you want to get great Mexican clothing? Go to a Mexican museum. Uh, then you have the permission of the culture because we are selling it. As long as it's the culture itself that does it. Don't you go and go, oh, I like that picture on Instagram, and then copy their culture. Because then you have no idea what you are doing, and you could be insulting yourself. Yeah, there are places and times where you can do it. There are places and things where you can never do it. And, and there are things that you should never do. Yeah. <laughs> And I want to talk about uh, a bit of uh, how you honestly take from other people and how you honestly show that you're actually admiring it. For example, if you watch my uh, Comedy Central stand up special, I talk about Green Lantern, Spider Man, Miles Morales, uh, He's a geek. Yeah, yeah, it's stand up but full of references. You know, Captain America would be proud, and Harry Potter. But I always talk about these characters as. You know, I love them. I'm a fan of these characters. I'm a fan of these histories, of these stories, and I want to make jokes about them. But it's quite different if I go, "Oh, I'm a fan of Patton Oswalt. Let me take a few of his jokes for my show." That's called plagiarism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that you really should do. And about and about honesty, when I was invited to moderate this panel, they told me, "Okay, this is the subject." But then a few hours ago, they told me, "Oh, you know, actually." <laughs> There was a B side to this panel, and it's called Our Book, because Ada and Mitch wrote a book which I wasn't aware I would be presenting. <laughs> <laughs> I like this We kept this thing secret for almost two years. I would have written some jokes, or perhaps not, because you told me, you told me there are some uh, themes <laughs> about uh, which you talk about in this book that I would never joke about, but uh, please go ahead and talk to us about One of the movies you know the hardest to begin to be honest with you, you did not want to mess with this person. <laughs> My she mom did. did. <laughs> this, is actually, this is actually her sweater. I am not kidding. Not uh, her mother's, that's sweater. My mother, this is why, talk about permission. Oh. My mother was Chavala's girlfriend. I, I am not kidding about this. So when we started thinking about this idea of the book, it was not originally with Chavela. And they said, hey, this would be totally Chavela jam. She would love to do what she does in the book. She so, said kidnap her other girlfriends. Okay, okay. The first thing Easy. we need to talk about what the book's about. Oh yeah, the book. Oh, you mean this one here? Can we get he to this? Oh, oh yeah, I mean right. that one, what a surprise. It's with the five dollar uh, Taco Bell box meal. <laughs> Yeah, Can I, folks? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very simple. I became fascinated with Chevelle. I've been talking to Anna anyway, but I became fascinated with Chevelle because there was a Netflix uh, documentary. And I was a disc jockey one time, so I used to do world music on my show. I worked at a jazz station. And yes, the devil does like jazz because in my movie I play Satan. So there answers that question probably for everybody, okay? He does like smooth jazz. But the thing is, I started getting into world music. So I'd come across her a long time ago and she did a very famous song that we all know named La Llorona, The Weeping Woman. La Llorona. And she pronounced it correctly, but I'm terrible at this. <laughs> that's the whole point. See, that's why I have her. But the point is that we found out that Shavella had a most interesting life. She was like an Indiana Jones. She was adventurous. She originally was Frida Kahlo's girlfriend which irritated her husband, Diego Rivera, to no end, and it got really interesting there. But in 1940, Mexico, there was another influence coming into the country. Now, you got to remember, at this point, this is just coming out of the Depression for America, U.S. America. Then in Mexico, which is still America, everybody, by the way, everybody get that right, they were having the same problems. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a 
Vice President Henry Wallace, who had developed a hybrid corn because the dust bowl had happened. People were starving in this country and their country. He developed a corn that could grow almost anywhere. And they had some irrigation systems down in Mexico that the U.S. would like to get their hands on so that we could irrigate it, grow, and make food for everybody. So this required some serious cooperation. So Wallace got his old Plymouth with his family and drove down to Mexico to see the new president being inaugurated. At that time, there were Nazi fifth colonists in Mexico trying to break this whole thing up. This way they could break the allies and you would never see something like the Three Caballeros now at Disney, how's that? Because they were going to break this whole thing up and stop it. Because a lot of people don't realize the reason there are blue-eyed and green-eyed Mexicans is because of a German influence. Because coffee and cacao, chocolate, was being grown by German planters who had come, and agronomists who had come there in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. So they already stepped a foothold. So, of course, in every culture, especially if you're a mixed bag, like especially like the U.S. is, because everybody comes from everywhere, you're going to get people that can come in and cause problems using people that they'll either threaten because they have family back home or whatever goes on. So when it came down to this, is knowing Chevelle's attitude and talking to Anna and her talking to her mother, she dealt with it, wasn't going to put up with it, and so we have this mm -hmm. book. Now you also had the pantheon of Mexican gods, and you had this one, I decided to invent this one Nazi, you know, fifth columnist, who had read a whole lot of H.P. Lovecraft, or thought he had read H.P. Lovecraft, <coughs> And he was trying to come up a way to bring the Elder Gods, Cthulhu and the rest, in. And of course, the battle between them and the pantheon of Mexican gods was about to happen. Because Mexico had one of the most vibrant cultures of gods you were ever going to, you're ever going to be able to fight. And in the middle of all that, Chavela Vargas, who is one of the greatest Mexicans that ever lived, despite not having been actually born in Mexico, but she had a lot of to say about that. Uh, is in the middle of that, fighting for her new girlfriend. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> and the girlfriend is the niece of Vice President Henry Wallace, who is just coming to grips with who she is as a person, what she sees about herself, her awakening is coming. And Chevella basically brings her to her awakening. So it's actually a love story along with an action adventure. And the question is, can the world be saved by a singer in a, drong in a drongo carrying pistols and knives, who likes to drink a whole lot, has this new US girlfriend, she's trying to help get to this situation resolved before the Nazis take over, or all the gods come in and decide, nobody's having a good time, let's just wipe it all out. How's all that in 350 pages. <laughs> Uh, but here we go with the appreciation part. Mitch did a lot of research. I mean, he found things that I had forgotten from elementary school. And that's what the fun really was, to surprising her. And that's what you can do with other oh people. Oh my god. Wait, we did that? <laughs> that actually happened, and yes, it did. But that is a respectful thing. Who likes, say, writing about uh, an Aztec warrior who decided to save the king, the queen of Spain, because reasons. Or maybe an Incan emperor who has a lot of group. I am not bitter about that movie. <laughs> See, that's the whole thing. As I did the research, I started finding out more interesting things and, call, and constantly calling Otto going, hey Otto, did you know this, this? I'm trying to find 1940 traffic patterns in Mexico just so I can get this right because I have this crazy chase through the city. And I want to make sure I had the right districts, the right everything down correctly so that I didn't wind up, you know, making up things that just would never happen. And any Mexican who read it go, that street doesn't go to there, this doesn't connect over to here. Because nobody would want that. If someone talked badly about your hometown or your home country, you'd be upset going, no, you've got that wrong. We're not like that. This is not like this and like this. It had to be respectful, so I had to ask the questions and I had to find out. Now, here's something else. My Spanish is Mets and Mets, using, you know, Italian term, how's that? Is. And the thing is, 
I wanted to see, she wanted to teach me more Spanish. I went, wait a minute. I want to see if I hear your music, talk to your people, read your history, understand your gods, understand how you've come to be, the conquerors, everything in between, if I can embrace and understand your culture well enough to be able to write about it. Because that's every writer's goal, is to make sure you can embrace this correctly. And you know something? I proved something to myself. It worked. Of course. Every writer I knew was telling me, you can't, you can't do things like, you gotta understand, you gotta immerse yourself. You gotta, I said, I wanna see if there's so much vibrancy, I can pick it up. Except when you decided to call my children, my cats. Okay, well, spell check. <laughs> Let's because talk about international there spell There was check. a lot of michos and michas that should have been mijos and mijas. <laughs> there is a difference but between a my about it child about. and my cat. <laughs> and I've had a lot of mixing friends before, so I know mija and mijo. And the damn spell check go, mijo and mija. And I call her up and she, I go, Mija, and she goes, and she goes, meow. <laughs> and I go, oh great. So now I'm sitting there going, I said, we got a whole new movie, we got a new version of Cats. Okay, Let's we're Chicago Let's not go that disaster. Not going to get into that either. Okay, the point is this. It's mm -hmm. worth it to do the research, it's worth it to find out, it's worth it to ask the questions, because you're going to discover things that maybe even your friends didn't know. And it reawakens them. It's not just Oh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. so, about the whole thing. When you were creating this story, how was the collaboration? Because I guess Anna was reading the story at the same time while you were writing it and not even done with the whole story. What's the illustrations? Besides the Nichos and Nichos, <laughs> how was the cultural exchange of, have, of writing a book? Well, someone was telling you, oh, you know, that actually feels Mexican. Oh, that, that doesn't feel Mexican. It was terrific because I actually had accurate information. I could sound intelligent if I discussed oh, it with someone else. Excuse me? Sounded yeah. intelligent? Okay. Come off intelligent? <laughs> yeah, not right. Emulate intelligent? I'm a writer. I, I got a theosaurus right here. I'm going to pull this up and start talking about all that. To be fair, I want to say this. Um, I think that the best part for me, as the Mexican, as the culture being appreciated, was when he asked me, what does it mean to be Mexican? What does it mean to be a Mexican? And he actually stumped me, because Mexicans, we are very proud of ourselves. We are very proud of being who we are. But I have never thought about putting it into words. And he made me do it. And I'm not going to tell you what I answered, because it's in the book. Okay. And it's, it's probably one of the most brilliant answers I've ever heard about anybody describing their culture, their belief system, anything. Because it was one sentence, it galvanized, and it pulled it all together quickly. And that's what we're looking for, that one great, like, like you know, in, in baking and cooking and the moose bouche you want that one perfect bite. But uh, again, with the actual surface of the, of the panel, it was his interest in my culture what made me find that reason why I love my own culture. Well, all culture, but oh, yeah, American. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just, because you're from Querétaro and I'm from Mexico City, so, you know. Hang on, there goes, there's 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 but, okay. Yeah, but we finished it. Like, Told you. <laughs> okay, okay. I have a little off-topic question, but I just, I'm just dying to ask this question to you. Decide what's in the book. We people, we love fights. No, not actual fights, but like fictional right. fights. You know, yeah, we all went crazy when we saw Kong versus Godzilla, Captain America versus Iron Man. Every, we, we were mad about it. Who guys do you think will win in an actual battle, in actual madrasas, between Cthulhu and Quetzalcoatl? Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. Want to know the truth? Quetzalcoatl. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, because I mean, I'm very versed in Lovecraft, a lot of the other, I mean, I, as a writer, and especially doing comic books, we all go into the gods and goddesses and things like that. So I, I've looked at a lot of different pantheons. I'm going to tell you something. Quetzalcoatl, pretty much could kick everybody's butt. Octopus versus 
feather snake, not pandas. The feather snake is cooler. Actually, it's a feather snake, but there's been some recent research that in uh, the sculptures of the Aztec culture, when they made snakes, they, they have pronounced fangs. The two snake fangs were pronounced, but when they did Quetzalcoatl, it had all the fangs. It was more Huge like dragon. dragon. Which makes some people believe that they may actually seen something all the way. Dinosaurs! Years yeah, that's the other thing. Hang on a second, Sam. I want to jump in because there's one thing I found fascinating when I started doing more research into the culture. Do you know that almost every culture has a story of a flood? And they've even had geological research done that these floods, and going through sedimentary rocks and what have you, they found these floods occurred almost at the exact same time. And every culture talked about it. And every culture talked about some great being or something coming along that stopped it or was the cause of it. So there's so much that's back there, lost into history that we don't know. Oh, probably Tlaloc uh, was angry that someone was washing his car. There we go. <laughs> really? <laughs> does it really, does he come <laughs> Okay, I would like you guys to say something about the book, about your project, before we open the Q&A section, because we're running it's out very of minutes. Fast. What is the question? <laughs> Station. It's simple. This book basically is proof. Instead of us telling you, we're going to show you that cultures can get together, we can work things out, we can understand each other, and we can entertain each other, and we can learn from each other. The greatest thing I learned out of all this, and it's going to sound really weird, is the fact that if a Mexican gives you a nickname, even if it's a nasty nickname, they took time <laughs> out of their lives to give you that name. So you must mean something, okay? Right there, you have worth. Even if they call you a nasty name, you have worth because they took time to tell you, you suck. <laughs> How's that? And I love you too, Robbie Walker. <laughs> there it is. As he said, I think it's a very good exercise, a very good example of how we can get together as long as we listen to each other. Because that's what I think that it comes through. We all, even those who take their time to steal from other cultures, it's because they like it, something in that other culture. So what about if instead of stealing, we start listening and we start learning again in order to give everyone a voice? And I think that this book is a great part of it. Okay, thank you. So it's really down to respect. You're all wearing masks, right? And you all got the wristband because you want to come in here and enjoy yourself, right? And see, and see everything, because you go over to the Gundam booth, or you go over to this booth, whatever it is, and they're all from, and they're all based on different cultures and things, but you're here to embrace and enjoy all of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, it's our culture. We are all geeks, right? So, so respecting we each other, we're respecting each other, but he's on it, doing the right thing. That's what it comes down to, too. So you've already done the right thing. Congratulations. And, and it's quite interesting that a relatively small and ethnically homogenous country like Japan has, has has had so much influence on global pop culture? Well, um, as a translator, I can answer that one. It's a little bit because for so long, they were a very close country. Not culture, country. Because they took a lot from China. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know the movie, Mr. Baseball. That movie has, I think, one of the best quotes of all time about this. We Japanese look at other cultures, <coughs> see what we like, take it, and make it work for us. Okay, do you, do you guys have any questions? Any yeah, other questions? We have that. Anyway. And then, yeah. Anyone, you can set up the microphone so you can be heard. Yeah. Yeah, remember, questions. we are still learning the masks, and it's kind of a filtered situation. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, so I was wondering because you, you worked with a story that was, you know, based on a lot of Mexican culture. Um, what, what I would like to ask is like, what aspects of Mexican culture? Because like you could say, oh, well, you know, it's from Mexico, but 
because we had such a diverse indigenous population. Exactly. Like the kind of people, the culture, the Mexican culture that is, say, from the city up in, you know, in Sonora, which are, you know, very matriarchal, it's going to be very different from like the Mayans that are still up in Yucatan mm -hmm. or in Chiapas. And I was kind of wondering, how do you blend all those cultures to, do you do well, you like, blend all those cultures together? It was like, for me, it was a difference between Veracruz, Puebla, or going to other districts. And remember, you also had, you know, you know, the Olmec, the Toltec, the Aztec, and they also had culture that splintered off. <laughs> So they went to their part of the country and went to this part of the country. What I was looking for was the common ground. The fact that they all had this particular feathered serpent god. They worshipped in this way, or they celebrated holidays in this way, or they treated each other in this way, or their food, or their, it was always really came down music and food. I wanted to see who came to who, who kind of combined with who, but they all seemed to point to one thing. Everything seemed to be a celebration of some kind or another. It seemed like they always found something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. So we were looking. I was looking more at the positivity of what was created from all of it. Although we spoke more with the Aztecs yeah. because they are the bad guys who all love to hate. Yeah, and I say that as a Mexican city. <laughs> yes, Aztec. So yeah. It's funny because there's like this very famous Tumblr quote, like Tumblr meme about King of the Hill, where they describe that Phoenix, Arizona is a monument to man's arrogance. I'm like, you've never been to Mexico City. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, have put, we have to put it in the middle of a lake, in a volcano, in a junction <laughs> between two mountain ranges at the very top, yeah. and it sinks. And there's the binding factor, because every, every one of the cultures I went and looked at, and every one of the areas I looked at, they all said the same thing. What the hell are they doing with this in the middle of a lake, with this volcano? That's, it's the one thing, the one the common ground. They both say so. Yeah, that's what I said. Like, it's the monument to man's arrogance to live in Mexico City. And, and the funny thing is that Moctezuma still really wanted fresh fish every day. But to get into the sea, you had to, like, run and... Uh, <laughs> okay, but that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you. One question, because that's going to be the last one, I think. Oh, okay. First Spider-Man. No, no, I want to see this. Okay, come on. Let's do this. Okay, okay yeah. Let's do it. Spider-Man. Yeah. Go. All right. Oh, two questions? Okay. Yeah. Spider-Man, then you. Okay. Um, so, hi, thank you very much for this panel. This has been great. I'm a visitor too. And uh, to me, the cultural appropriation thing, you probably are very familiar with this, the cultural appropriation thing to me was so bizarre because we don't have that in Mexico. And uh, that, that, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you because um, here I, I, came, I came to the States and everybody was talking about the cultural appropriation in Halloween and all that and how you shouldn't dress like an Indian and how you shouldn't dress like a, with a kimono or something like that. And I was thinking, hey, and if in Mexico I go to a Halloween party as a samurai, nobody's gonna have the knife, right? Because we don't have that concept. And here I come and I say, hey, I'm gonna do it as a, as a samurai. And, and I don't know if, because me not being white, I don't know if people are gonna complain, but I will see people well, saying, oh, my culture, I I went to a party, I remember I went to a party in a Cinco de Mayo party in <laughs> New York. And uh, they put me a charro sombrero uh, with a big, big uh, mustache. Here we go. With a margarita. And, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. It's something that he did. Oh, the, the glasses of the oh, yes. was, right? And it's like, if, if these people knew that this doesn't even make sense. But, but it was fun, right? And for well, me, it's not offensive. That's the thing. Uh, for us, it's fun. If it is fun, it's Mexican culture. <laughs> you, go, you give us enough tequila. I'm oh never going to say anything. With the samurai, I mean, we had Toshiro Mifune. Tosh, Toshiro Mifune, great Japanese actor, played a Mexican bandito in many movies made in Mexico. But again, it comes to, I learned about it because I asked. I have a ton of friends here in the States. And when I started hearing about cultural appropriation, instead of saying, oh, that is ridiculous, uh -huh. which was, granted, the first instinct of many Mexicans, I asked, I said, wait, why? Why is it bad? And when they explained it to me, and it happened, the Oaxaca thing with the fashion stores, I said, oh my god, yes, that's wrong. And on the other end, on the other end, from, well, let's just say the Caucasian or the white end of it, it simply comes down to this. 
it's a lack of a true national identity in their own way because it's a mixed bag of everybody from everywhere in a lot of ways, so it's an insecurity sometimes that pops up. But the great part about it is, is that you're looking for something cool, something different. So go look for that cool thing, but just ask permission or talk about it before you do it sometimes. It'll do you a lot of good. That's what it comes down to. Okay. So you're looking for a good time. So, so basically, you guys are having fun. If, if I understand you correctly, and I think I get you, and I thank you very much for clarifying this, but it's like, if I wanted to dress as a samurai, it's not cool if you just dress it. It's, it's better if you learn about it. And yeah. I think that's the biggest step of it. And, and if you want to be a Mexican thing. samurai, check out Toshiro Mifune. Okay. We have a question, and I think that's going to be the last one. This is part of a master question, but if, considering you said that, um, uh, the, so, uh, uh, I'm just going to read it. If we have the gods like the Boca and uh, with that he killed his 400 brothers with just a swing of his weapon, then who's stronger? Then uh, which of them will get the Which will be stronger? Because the Scatipoca, you know. Um, well, never discuss you know, religion, uh, politics, and gods. Yeah, we just keep it. Politics? Never discuss politics, religion, football, soccer, and this is a com combination of the three. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> this is God's, this is the God politics. I, would I did say the research and found there really was a political system between all of them. It's I would say again Quetzalcoatl, because Quetzalcoatl at the end of the day was the God of hope. And hope should be more powerful than war, every single time. I think on that note. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Either way. Yes. Just quickly. Yeah. Because we don't yeah. want to ever take that man at the door. starting to kind of. Sit I have a piece to add that I think um, I really appreciated hearing your perspective coming from somewhere outside of the U.S. I think within the U.S., when we talk about appropriation, there's we have to keep in mind oppression, right? So it is offensive for a white person to wear box braids or an afro because those things were used to oppress black mm -hmm. people, right? Going back to your samurai example, um, in the United States, we had a history of Japanese internment during World War II, during which time a lot of Japanese history and culture was erased. Right, so, so for a white person to step into, or a non-Japanese person to step into that costume becomes offensive because it's a person with privilege celebrating something about exactly. a culture that was oppressed and taken from that culture. Exactly. That's Without exactly. giving credit to the culture, it really comes down to Correct. just give credit. That's it. And well, just to close up, if you want to keep talking to us about this, and buy the book, <laughs> we are at uh, table double D 42 in the other side. Okay, and thank you all so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.